Hi, welcome to our Bible study. Today we'll be starting in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 9, continuing. What can I say? Hebrews to me has been incredible, fascinating, life changing. Uh, of course, anytime you study the Word of God, it's important. The entire book Bible is important, but Hebrews is rich in what it has. Anyway, thank you for coming along on our journey through Hebrews. Hope you have a blessed rest of your day. It's 6 01. Should we begin? I guess we should begin. You know, the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, as we enter into your scripture today, we, we thank you uh, for your scripture. We thank you for the word of God. And Lord, uh, open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today as we go through this treasure trove of uh, today, first talking about the tabernacle. And Lord, give us more insight into why you would spend the entire chapter talking about the old tabernacle and comparing it to Christ. Help us with that, Lord, and open our minds to more things we'd normally think about. As it is your word, and it's rich and it's living and, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you again for this time together, the ability to meet this way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So again, we're in Hebrews chapter nine. We're in the middle of the talking about the tabernacle, the uh, big description of the tabernacle. I thought it was interesting. Um, that video uh, talked about um, oh, he kind of compared it to Christ and, and kind of looked at it in that way and why God would spend so many chapters in Exodus explaining to Moses how to how to build a tabernacle, you know. Uh, I guess it was God's first do-it-yourself book. Well, I should say no, that's not true. He did the ark first. That was the one. That was the first. This is the second God do-it-yourself kit. So we'll begin um, on my screen. Katrina, you're first. Could you uh, begin, please, by reading Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, please? I can't hear you're muted, Katrina. Okay. Okay. Well, no, thank you for muting when you're not talking. It helps all of us. Thank okay. you. Anyway, it, go ahead. Was the, it was the symbol for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifice are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regards to the co consequences concerning only with food and drink, various washings and fleshly ordained imposed upon the time of formation. Okay, wow. Okay, let me read nine, uh, let me read nine uh, in the Amplified. Seeing that the first, that's the outer portion of the tabernacle was a parable, a visible symbol or type or picture of the present age. In it, gifts and sacrifices are offered and yet are incapable of performing or perfecting rather the conscience or of cleansing and renewing the inner man of the worshiper. And that's going looking at the Hebrew and bringing in, in this case, I'm sorry, the Greek and bringing out the meaning of it. So when I'm looking at this, the sacrificial system, the old sacrificial system pre-Jesus, if you will, um, was basically a symbol or a sign that like he calls it uh, in a parable if you will a look at what was coming and the one thing it couldn't do is cleanse the conscience um what the writer of the hebrews talks about and elsewhere of course the new testament is that um our conscience not just our sins are forgiven and they are the sacrifice of christ once and for all made us clean from our sins if we trust in that sacrifice and trust in him but the nice thing about it and what what the writer here is trying to talk about is the cleansing of the conscience also now you know when you're doing something uh, if you feel guilty about it uh, you might you might have a friend of yours tell you uh, you might wrong a friend of yours and uh, give him something wrong for him and then oh you're sorry you know i, I apologize and your friend says, no problem, you're my friend, I forgive you. Well, you can be forgiven, except you kind of still feel bad about what you did. And it just, it's there. And it's there for us too, but 
here, what the writer here is trying to talk to us to do is we need to move forward, not just knowing that our sins are forgiven, but also knowing that our conscience is clear. You know and I know, we all know, when you're doing something, if something's on your mind or on your conscience, it can affect your work and be a negative impact. He's talking to us, you know, we, we hear here in the Bible, go bold, therefore go boldly, Paul talks about, to the throne of grace, where you shall receive mercy. We walk boldly to Christ's throne. We, after the cleansing of our sins by Christ's sacrifice, we can now boldly move forth and do good works. Not that they're going to save us, but they're a fruit, a benefit of our clean conscience and our having our sins having been forgiven. Is what I'm trying to say, I guess. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 6 11. Um, Paul saying after that litany of all the bad things, and such were some of you once, but you were washed clean, and in the, in the Greek, purified by a complete atonement for sin and made free from the guilt of sin. That's what the word in Greek means. And you were consecrated, that is set apart or hallowed, and you were justified pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God. So again, talking here, when you're looking at these two verses, a cleansing of conscience, not just forgiveness of sin, but the old system could, couldn't do that, could not give, clean your conscience. You still had the guilt. But here we have the promise of a clean conscience. But that's something we have to walk into. It's like other spiritual things. We have to accept and walk into it and believe. And if we believe that, it's counted to us for righteousness, and we move forward in our lives. It's uh, amazing when, when you think about it. And it's it's and more than one time in my life, you know, I've stand, stood on this scripture because, Lord knows, I've done plenty of bad things, but I, I'm trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus to be sufficient to forgive me for my sins. So washing and cleansing, not just from sin, but from the guilt of sin. The freedom from guilt helps us by clearing the way for us to serve and to worship Christ. All right, we'll move forward. Bill, you're next on my big, the big screen here. Could you read verses 11 and 12, please? The title is Redemption Through the Blood of Christ. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Yes, and... The, the, the Amplified says, having found and secured a complete redemption, that is an everlasting release for us. So, again, remember we're comparing Old Testament tabernacle, New Testament worship. We're talking about uh, why is this superior? And why should the Hebrews, the Jews, abandon the worship where you had to kill uh, bulls and goats and various animals as an atonement for sin, which was only a picture. And here we're talking about, again, the superiority of Christ's high priest. Okay, He himself enters the Holy of Holies because he was the sacrifice. You know, the, the priest, the high priest you know, in the old system, the only way a high priest could go in, we, I've beaten this to death, but we had sacrifices and washings and cleansings. And, and if he didn't do it right, his little bells at the bottom of his robe didn't jingle anymore because he was dead in there and they had to yank him out by rope, okay? Because no one else is supposed to go in the Holy of Holies except the high priest. So, but Christ's perfect sacrifice of himself, him being the sacrifice, he, again, has entered into the Holy of Holies for us to make atonement for our sins. Okay. So in, in Numbers... Um, talking about the number of bulls and goats and rams that have to be sacrificed for, you know, this and for that. Yeah. Man, it was a bloody, bloody 
horrific place. And how long did it take? Um, <laughs> as we get into this, they talk about the high priest literally had a, I mean, Christ walks in and sits down. His work's accomplished. The high priest had to stand there and do all this. They had to retire. I, okay, and I'm trying to remember. They had a, only a time when they could serve. And I believe that age 50, they had to stop. Um, because it just, it was physically, it age wore them out. Is correct. Oh, man. It, it, it's, yeah. A, a, a Christianity is a bloody religion. But we are told without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So, again, but Christ's sacrifice being perfect eliminates the need for all those sacrifices. And we can go off on another, go into a rabbit hole and talk about the fact that during the millennial kingdom, the, the sacrificial system will be reinstated. And I've heard this this week, I've heard multiple people talking about why it needs to be done or what the reason is. And I've heard some honest pastors and, and, and commentators say, you know, I don't understand why, but it's going to be done. Okay, you know, so anyway. But that's well, whoever's, sacri- doing, uh, whoever's doing whoever's doing all the cutting is gonna probably end they'll probably end up in jail for animal cruelty, huh? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So that'll be a very interesting uh sacrificial system from uh from their jail cell. Um but this whole this whole chapter is uh, explaining to the Jewish hearers of this letter that the reason to abandon, um, you know, many centuries of of uh, what they were doing, because you know this cannot perfect the conscience of the worker worshiper, as it, and you know so that the the tabernacles are merely a symbol of the old covenant, right. and we're moving, and, and the author is trying to move the the Jewish believers to the new covenant, which. As we know, we're not good with change. So, how long they've been doing this sacrificial thing? What, what 1,500, 1,600 years? Is that about right? Yeah. So, you've been doing something for 1,600 years, and now some, someone says, Yeah, well, you don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. Really? And that, that is, you know, that's going to be a tough, a tough go, you know. So, yes. Yep. Um, kicking and, we go problem. kicking and screaming into change sometimes. Yeah. Uh, that, no, you know, that's a very good point. Why there's a whole chapter on the tabernacle here, and slowly moving towards the new covenant, you know. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, we go. We we don't like changing the morning Sunday morning service. You know, you want to move this to that or insert oh. this as well. We've never done it that way before. You know that word goes. Absolutely. Don't ask somebody to sit in a different pew. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Presbyterians <laughs> don't like the new pews. No. Yeah, so I yeah, can we're still not remember good. we're not going to change. I can still remember as a child where we sat in Riverside Presbyterian Church. I remember what pew we were in. We sat there every week, you know. Just just sure. forward of the balcony on the right hand side for whatever reason. Away from the windows, not very smart, but I sat with my parents. You know, I had no choice in the matter. So. Don't forget, anyway. years, years, oh. and years ago, you used to rent your pew. Um, That's true. Yeah. So, uh, Did neighbor you, have to rent the pew at the Presbyterian Church? Yeah. So you 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 paid rent on that pew, so you obviously you always sat in the same one because you you paid to do so. And uh, I think that got carried forward a little bit. Is that anybody the well to do? No. That'd be, you know, that'd be a good uh, money-making idea for a church. Rent your you pew. Be- that would go over like a... Uh, <laughs> that would Man, we like try. Try. Yeah. 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 No, I, no, I understand. It wouldn't work. Of course, back then, too, if, if you remember and looking at some of the pictures and the illustrations of the old churches, the walls, you'd be in your box. You'd rent this box. You're in the box, and there were walls around you. I mean, you were in your box. So you could, yeah. other than the pastor, could throw something at you if you, if you dozed off. You know, nobody next to you would know because <laughs> the wall's up, you know. 
that's, that's what I thought of as soon as I saw it. But uh, the pastor at that time had complete control over the congregation. I'm sure he wouldn't let you snooze, you know. Uh, anyway. All right. Um, so, again, uh, we're moving forward and, again, continuing to look at the tabernacle. Lori, could you read 13 and 14? The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean. Sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Amen. And verse 13, really the point, um, blood of goats and bulls, not sufficient to pay for our sins, only a picture or a type of Christ. Um, him, him making the supreme sacrifice to satisfy the justice of a holy God. He himself had to die to make a way for us to be able to approach the throne. Again, it's something we, having grown up in the faith, we take it, I take it for granted sometimes. I mean, I know uh, the, the Passion of the Christ, I could never watch the movie, but that movie illustrates uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross. Um, it doesn't remind us, though, that in Isaiah, and it pleased God to crush him. It was God's plan for him to die. Um, and Jesus entered into that. And technically, according to God, which we'll get into later in the book, as I'm moving forward through the book, some fascinating stuff. But remember, in God's eyes, time, talked about this at the very beginning. Time is the same to God. The timeline, God's above time. So he talks about the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So in God's mind, Jesus, back when Abraham was talking to God, the way God could talk to Abraham was the fact that that sacrifice was made. And God being above time, other than that, a holy God would have incinerated Abraham, because Abraham was, was a, a sinner, just like the rest of us. So that perfect sacrifice had to happen, even though it's, you know, we all have, have there's a, I don't remember Adventures in Odyssey. Uh, I, I used to listen to it on the radio. Focus on the Family had a kid's thing, and they had a machine that the kids could go into and go back and, and enter into different biblical stories. And uh, I always thought as a kid, if I could go back in time and stop Jesus from dying on the cross. A naive kid, didn't know. Um, but that couldn't happen. It had, Jesus had to die for our sins in order for us to have the relationship with God, which makes what he did all the more precious to us, to me. Uh, and sometimes we need reminders of just what he did and why it had to happen it was um, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Um, and that sacrifice had to take place. And Mike, well, we're going to look at verse 15. It gives us a little more insight into that, if you'd read, please. Verse 15? Yes. Uh, Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so okay. that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Okay, now, a couple of important things here. It says that this is a, number one, it's a new covenant. Number two, we get into Calvinism, you know, for those who were called. So that those who are called and offered it in the in the amplified may receive the fulfillment of the promised everlasting inheritance. You know, so again, called. And do you remember? Um, I'm going off on a tangent, but it's it's pertinent. Do you guys remember when we watched the uh, uh, the, the movie? We did it in segments. Um, uh the american gospel christ crucified we watched both of them but the first one was uh to me was 
This one's usually the best anyway. But do you remember when we went through that? We had to buy it. I gave you all books and everything. Anyway, oh, okay. I was watching. Yeah, that's, that's a little fuzzy. Oh, that? Exactly. That was a few years ago now, Mike. That was uh, <laughs> 2019. Oh. Yeah. That that the movie had just that's come good. out. Yeah. Um, my point is this. I was why we're going to show that as the Knox monthly movie in uh, July, um, and just I was looking for the trailer, and of course you do a search in YouTube, and you come up with all sorts of stuff. Well, there's a pastor who came out, a couple of pastors that came out, and they were doing interviews about how they, uh, while they believed in the the negative aspects of the movie coming out against Joe Olstein and. Uh, Todd White and, and so on, and Benny Hinn, all the, the, the prosperity gospel, they were adamant in, in the fact that they didn't like the fact that it was a Calvinistic movie, meaning this Calvin, it's this way or the highway type thing, you know, which, okay, I believe that, but it, it rubs some Christians the wrong way, the Armenian Christians, if you will, yeah. uh, Armenian, you know, so, um, I thought that was fascinating. But anyway, that's the only reason I mentioned that. But here again, this, and this is throughout the New Testament, but those who are called and offered it, it's a it's a general call. Let all who would come, come, we're told, okay? And yet here the writer of the Hebrews mentions to those who are called and offered it. So, um, Well, Jesus talks about, uh, saving all those that were given to him to save. So, yes. you know, you can go around and around about Calvinism and Armenianism. Um, uh, I I typically revert back to American history, whereupon when evangelists started coming from Europe and started talking about uh, using the words Lord and Sovereign and things like that, typically drew knives and guns. Uh, when they started talking so they stopped using that pitch if you will and switched to the one far more familiar pitch which is if you made a choice for christ you know they put the control into the um the person's choice rather than you know my belief that you were chosen um uh before you were born so you know that's that that, that is more of a uh, commonsensical thing that they did to avoid, you know, get that stamp yeah, it'd be for the out. sake or whatever. Yes. Yeah. So you know, uh, this country was, you know, formed by people who revolted against that kind of thing. So um, they didn't want to hear about sovereigns and lords. So. <clears throat> well, and you know, we can fast forward to um, the slavery issue. I mean. The, the translation, the, the word, the real translation of the word uh, bond servant is slave. But slave has, slavery had such a horrible connotation to it, rightfully so, the way it was instituted during uh, in the 18th, 19th, but before that, centuries, uh, that they changed the word to bond servant. They, they made it different. So uh, people didn't want to hear about lordship, in your case, you want to hear about being a slave of Jesus in our case. Uh, people revolted against that. When you talk, start talking about that, Mike, I'm reminded of Charles Finney, who was uh, based out of, down around Elmira, New York. And he, had, he was an evangelist, but he was uh, of the Armenian persuasion. Um, and he did the, uh, if you raised your hand, you were counted as saved, as opposed to people who really uh, yeah. trusted Jesus. Um, and consequently, he left a, a, a lot of debris behind when he, he they stopped at Rochester. They wouldn't allow him to come to Buffalo. Did you know that? I didn't no. know that. <laughs> yeah, they, they wouldn't let him come here. They he stopped. He, he went to Rochester, but he never came to Buffalo because they stopped. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, uh, my younger son, James, there is, is pretty Calvinistic. I don't know why, but uh, he is. So, anyways, he uh, he had gone. They had gone to a Baptist church, 
and uh, and got in a conversation with the minister after the service, and and James asked him how he reconciled his free will with with uh, God's sovereignty, and uh, the minister said we don't. So you know that's that's the problem with the, the Armenian view. You know there there can only be one sovereign, and and it's not you. So you know that that's the right. issue. <clears throat> so. Anyway, well, R.C. R.C. Sproul, you know, I said this over and over. When we enter in the ports of heaven, it'll say, uh, it'll say on the on the, the arches we're walking through that all all who would come come. And uh, on the other side of this it, arch, we're going to look back and see uh, chosen from the foundation of the world. You know, so it's I don't know. It, it, it's it's a, he was the main guy there for. Uh, uh, apologetics if you will for calvinism speaking and and debating on the, those issues um uh, and he was pretty good at it huh so <laughs> yeah man yeah anyway. and i never was a drc fan until i started watching some more of his stuff he's and i listen to his podcast every day he that is dead yet speaketh you know um but he's got some good stuff i'm becoming more and more of an rc fan anyway i digress yeah. Um, move on, moving on to, uh, make sure 16. I got this right. Yeah. Six, 16 through and 16 through 18, Marie. Um, for where is, there is a last will and testament involved. The death of the one who made it must be established for a will and testament for 17 is valid and takes effect only at death since it has no force or legal power, as long as the one who made it is alive. And verse 18, so even the old first covenant, God's will was not inaugurated and ratified and put into force without the shedding of blood. So again, um, we continue to talk about uh, the, the shedding of blood without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The old covenant was only enforce, enforceable or allowable, if you will, because there was the shedding of blood. And prior to the Mosaic Covenant, I mean, there were sacrifices going on. I'm reminded of that uh, uh, when Abraham made the uh, challenge God and says, uh, um, Abraham said, Lord God, why, what shall I know that I shall inherit it? Because God told you, you're going to inherit all this land and gonna, your, your, your children are going to be the number of the stars in the sky and the sands on the beach. And Abraham boldly talking to God says, well, how do I know this is going to happen? And that's when God did uh, uh, another sacrifice, if you will, and the, the heifer cut in half and the, the uh, bull cut and she goat uh, and uh, cut down the middle and lay on each side. And God went through the whole ritual of putting Abraham into a deep sleep and walking through it and uh, telling him that is it's the covenant is a valid covenant he will enforce it he will he will be honor what he says he will do and again the the, the blood if you will uh of, of the sheep and the goats in this case the bulls and the, the goats uh was a sign that god was going to to make this happen and again as we know that that hammurabic code would be uh may it happen to me I mean, this happened to me if I don't carry out the covenant. So God made the, the promise. Um, and then, of course, God continues in that passage in Genesis to explain to him uh, what's going to happen about them being slaves. And uh, rather than read all this, um, you're going to go in peace, but then your descendants are going to be enslaved for a while because the one one group of people in there, the, the Amorites, haven't totally... Uh, made me angry yet <laughs> the iniquity of the amorites is not yet complete it says so so that's again that's the blood the covenant had to be enforced with blood um, it's interesting they use abraham as uh, an example there because he's declared righteous by god before this covenant is instituted correct. so it does make you question you know the the the, the all the bloodletting you know so and Mike, in that passage I'm just reading, um, in in Genesis, 
that is the uh, that's where he told them where we're told that it was faith was counted to him as righteousness and it's in that same whole thought process and then Abraham wants some proof that it's going to be going to come to pass so right. I guess we all ask God for myself included Lord can you just give me a little bit of us I, I we all tend to sometimes become um, Gideon you know uh, just just you know could you and um, we're not given a sign you know even the, when Jesus was here they wanted a sign and he says yeah you're gonna get the only sign you're gonna have is a sign of Jonah you know, which is his resurrection after three days so well, we're, again, we're, no verse, we're no different we want proof of things right absolutely absolutely I mean, that's, we that's, want that's human nature you know so yep Amen. all right um Serena, could you read verses 19 through 21? Okay. <clears throat> For when Moses has spoke every perception to all people according to hip hypocrisy and sprinkling both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the book, the this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then, likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Amen. So again, blood is, historically, blood has been used as a purifier. And we're told about the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Um, and to your point, Mike, Judaism was a bloody religion. I mean, most of the other the false gods demanded quote unquote demanded sacrifices and including their own children in some cases but here they do the sacrifices and you can imagine you got a group of two million people he's throwing blood out at them uh, and at them and you've made the covenant you've said you're gonna enforce the you're gonna you're going to do all these things that i told you to do so okay this is the blood that then the blood was a symbol of course of what jesus would do and fast forward to um the night before our lord the night our lord was betrayed he instituted communion if you will which is the how, sacrament of the how often did that the, a regular person do this scott how often did you go get uh sprinkled of um you know ashes and blood and all that stuff you know. To my knowledge, Mike, it only happened at one time. Um, they had to do the sacrifices and all that, but they didn't sprinkle the people anymore. They sprinkled the altar and they sprinkled, you know, the, the mercy seat. When the whole high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he, he had sprinkled a So it wasn't a normal thing, but this was the initiation of the covenant, initiation of the blood covenant with the people of Israel. God says, I will do all this for you. And if you remember a couple, a few weeks ago now, we went through the litany of uh, all those verses in Deuteronomy. Okay, I'm going to do this for you, but if you don't hold up to that covenant, here's what's going to happen to you. And of course, as we know, they never held up their end of the bargain, if you will, or rarely. And so God, and it, God performed what he said he would do. And it, it's still the curse on Israel continues to this day. Got it. Um, you know, all you got to do is go over there and try and grow something without irrigation, you know? Sprinkled uh, once mm here. -hmm. Sprinkled once. And now, as with communion, we take, we remember some, some churches do it every week. Um, some do it uh, once a month, like the week. And the, some, when I was growing up, we did it once a quarter, the communion, so. Every church yeah, is different, I, but again, I, I, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. You froze. Uh, were you going to say something, Mike? I'm sorry. From a practical standpoint, I was wondering, you know, how often it occurred. Yeah, yeah it, I was just wondering how often it occurred because, you know, you know it, there, you know, there's no, uh, there's no water to be wasted on yeah. bathing yeah. all the time, right? So you coming out of there going wow i'm a, I'm a mess here and right. you know so you're walking around <laughs> yep. uh, yeah it'd be ugly 
But you know, fast forward to Roman Catholicism, um, which is a, a works based, yeah, Jesus is in there, but you know, there's other things going on too. When the high priest performs the mass, what does he do? What does he do? Walks around with the censer, the incense, and he's sprinkling the, the congregation. Now he doesn't use blood, he's doing quote unquote holy water, but he's sprinkling the congregation. And that's again the melding of the two. Catholicism tends to be a melding of the Roman gods and uh, a works based Judaism and Christianity, if you will. It's it's a mess. But anyway, you, you end up with uh, there are there are saved people in the Catholic Church. I believe that can I believe that firmly. Uh, and yet, uh, not not because of what the priests are doing for them. It's all because of Jesus. Okay, we're moving on. Um, verses twenty two to twenty four, Bill, if you would. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. <clears throat> And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Uh, and the key phrase there, first of all, in verse 24, the key phrase, on our behalf, he appears one time, okay? He did as our representative. But verse 22 is one of the uh, tenets of the faith, if you will. The Amplified, I don't like the Amplified here. I prefer the, uh, the King James, actually. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. I remember that um, blood is a blood covenant. Um, and in the Ju Judaism, the blood is the blood of uh, it's a showcase or a type of Christ. They're sacrificing bulls and goats as a picture of what Jesus is going to do. We are on this side of the cross. <laughs> and we are the recipients of the of not having to do all that anymore because Christ has entered into the sanctuary. Not a copy of the sanctuary, but the real sanctuary in heaven, one time on our behalf, uh, to present his blood as a sacrifice for our sin. And God accepted the sacrifice and proved it by raising him from the dead. So Jesus' sacrifice was a good sacrifice. We know that because Jesus rose from the dead. And there were over 500 witnesses that saw him after he rose from the dead. So it's not like, well, we think he, we think he was born, you know, he came up again. No, he, was, he, he did rise from the dead. Okay, right. um, so verse um, 25 and 26, Laurie, if you would read those. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. And Christ would have suffered many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen. That single sacrifice was sufficient to clean, to cleanse us and cover us from our sin. Um, we, they, and he's, again, talking to the Jews. Guys, you don't have to do this anymore. And this, this, the book of Hebrews or the letter to the Hebrews is as clear a, uh, a call for them to quit the sacrificial system as there is in the Bible. And yet they wouldn't listen. The sacrifices went on until, as we know, 70 AD, God stopped them himself. He allowed the, the Jerusalem to be destroyed. Anyway. And now here again, come up another one of the tenets of the faith. Um, verses 27 and 28. Mike. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with uh, 
was sent, but to save those who are eagerly await, waiting for him. And the eagerly, constantly, and patiently is the, the translation, awaiting, awaiting for and expecting him. So again, now, the, we're talking about the sacrificial system. We're talking about uh, the tabernacle. Uh, and here uh, in one verse, um, we are reminded of what life is all about. It is appointed for all men once to die. And after that, the certain judgment. So we all will die. We don't get a second chance. You, you listen to the New Age stuff today. It, it ranges everywhere. But reincarnation is very popular now. Well, we're going to get a second chance. And, of course, uh, the, the Hindu faith, uh, you come back as a uh, something. If, you, if your karma is good, if, you're, if you live this life well, you, you upgrade. If you don't live this life well, well, then you get downgraded to a, I guess it works. the worst you can get downgraded to is like a fly or something. But <laughs> the Bible blows that up entirely in that one verse. The no, we all die once, and then the certain judgment, and we are all going to be judged. And I' not going to beat that dead horse. We talked about it, but there is a judgment for everyone, and ours. Glory to God, and thank you, Jesus. Ours is the judgment of the righteous, of the ones who have trusted in Christ for the sacrifice to pay for our sins. So we're going to be judged on what we've done here. We're not going to be judged on our sin because Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a, a, sin has left a something stained, be washed as white as snow, fearful stain. So was that? Crimson. Crimson thing. Thank you very much. You're right. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Uh, and that's the outgo of uh, every day. If you listen to Jay Bernard McGee, he used that every day. So I should know that. Anyway, um, but that's done. We don't have to worry about that, unfortunately, uh, or justly, if you want to look at it that way, from God's standpoint, if you don't accept that sacrifice that he himself made for our sins then you're going to have to pay for it on your own and, and, and so, you know. a lot of people today believe in reincarnation and and, and it's uh interesting how they're able to mix uh their beliefs you know but here verse 27 be a good one to remember if you're talking to somebody that um kind of believes they're going to come back as as somebody else or something else so yeah get another right. chance of course. right yeah. right um and again it's pervasive throughout and mike and to your point what you just said we all if we don't believe in the true god we all make a god for ourselves now in the case of atheism itself you know you are your own god if you will because you worship yourself because there, there isn't any god i'm, I'm worshiping myself i'm it um but in the case of uh, of everyone else, they'll make a God that they can please and make their own rules up so that well, they can they can appease this God or, and they'll make it easy on themselves. Well, God will forgive me for this or uh, we'll make up a, a God that it's uh, uh, if we do more good things than bad things before I was saved. If I do more good things than bad things. God's going to be all right. You know, that's what I thought. Uh, fortunately, you know, I, I, I didn't wasn't killed before I accepted Christ as my Savior. Otherwise, I would be in hell today. You know? And so, will anyone? Uh, sadly, anyone who believes the nonsense that they make up themselves um, will be consigned to hell for eternity. Um, the sad thing is, the even sadder thing is, and what. Jesus talks about fewer stripes and many stripes. Um, people who live in this country who have had the gospel permeated through society, now it's not so much now, but it's still out there, who had the opportunity to accept Christ and rejected him. Well, hell's going to be a lot hotter for them than those who've never heard of him. So, and I don't know how that works. I'm just all I can say is here's what Jesus said. Um, 
I just want to move before we move on into chapter. Can we finish chapter nine? Uh, we only have four more to go. Before we move on, I want to go through a look at the tabernacle and what Christ uh, has done as far as okay, compare tabernacle with Jesus, okay, and the different parts of the tabernacle. Um, there's seven comparisons. There's an article that was written by an R.C. Sproul guy. I believe his name is Lewis. And I was looking at that and thought it was interesting. He lists seven different comparisons between um, the tabernacle and Jesus, the, the original tabernacle, the Jewish tabernacle, if you will, and the Mosaic Covenant and Jesus. <clears throat> and first of all, he talks about the table of the showbread comparing Christ teaching that he is the bread of life. Remember, the showbread was in the tabernacle. It, they had one one loaf for every tribe. David ate it, uh, and God didn't count it as sin. Jesus talked about that. But uh, Jesus told us in John 6, 35, he is the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me and cleaves to me and trusts in and relies on me will never thirst any more at any time. Then we have the menorah. Uh, the menorah, if you remember in the, in the tabernacle, seven candle, one, seven lamps on the top, um, made famous uh, by the uh, Jews back during the time of the Maccabean revolt, and they ran out of oil. It took them seven days to make this oil, and they were out of oil, and they prayed, and God kept the candle, the menorah, as a miracle. Um, and so Purim is that festival they still celebrate today of the miracle of the menorah the lamp's not going out in the menorah but comparing that that jesus is the light of the world in john 8 12 once more jesus addressed the crowd he said i'm the light of the world he who follows me will not be walking in the dark but will have the light which is life and then there's the, the door the door to the tabernacle you remember seeing the tabernacle there's only one way to get in you they have a fence all the way around um, and if you were a God worshiper, a Jew at that time, you definitely wouldn't go in unless you were a high priest. It was a, it would stop you. Well, Jesus is the door, if you will. He's the only way. Um, John 10, 7 through 9. Jesus said again, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you that I myself am the door for the sheep. All others who came as such before me are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to and obey them. I am the door. Anyone who enters in through me will be saved, will live. He will come in and will go out freely and will find pasture. And again, Jesus is one way. There's only one way to salvation. There's only one way into the tabernacle, through that, through the, the, the guarded fence on the outside and the horse. The Holy of Holies was, you had the big veil in there to stop anybody from going into that. Um, the altar, of course, um, compares to, and now he compared it to Jesus being the good shepherd. Uh, okay, yeah, well, I look at the altar as the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Uh, his sacrifice was, he was the, the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And that the altar was where that took place. Um, the laver, which was outside the tabernacle, before the priests could go in, they had a wash in this laver. It was a, made of bronze. It's fairly good size. They used it to wash before they went in. Um, compares to Christ teaching that he is the resurrection, new life. Jesus said, that I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes and adheres to trust and relies on me, although he may die yet. But Jesus was talking to Mary. So, again, the laver, comparing it to him being the resurrection. Um, the screen to the courtyard gate and, and compares to the fact that Jesus is the way. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life it comes to the Father except through me. And then the anointing of the priest that they talk about in the, the Judeo system is similar to that fact that Jesus is the vine. 
Um, and Jesus tells us, John 15, 5 through 8, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much fruit, abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. The person does not dwell in me. He is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and they are burned. If you live in me, that is abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts. Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. When you bear much fruit, and it produce much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified, and you show good yourself true followers of mine. So that's um, a quick overview of the tabernacle. I'll send this out when I send out my notes. Uh, it's interesting. And again, it's a picture. We know the sacrificial system was a picture of what Christ would do for us. The temple itself was a picture of the heaven, heavenly tabernacle, and each part means something. We'll begin going on to verse chapter 10, rather. So, Mike, you read last, right? I did. Okay. So now we're going to begin chapter 10 today. We've got a few minutes left. Um, I'll begin reading chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 1 through 4. For since the law has was merely a rude outline, a foreshadowing of the good things to come, instead of fully expressing those things, it can never, by offering the same sacrifice continually year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. Verse 2. For if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not have stopped being offered? Since the worshipers had once for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. Verse 3, but as it is, these sacrifices annually bring a fresh remembrance of sins to be atoned for. Verse 4, because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take sin away. And again, um, reminded here. Law of Moses required many sacrifices, especially the annual day of atonement. Do you remember there were two goats? One goat was slaughtered, blood was sprinkled on the altar on the mercy seat. The other goat was they laid their guilt on the on the goat, and the goat was let out from among the congregation and never returned. Um, so it was supposed to carry away the sins of the people. But that was done every year. Um, that's the day of atonement. That's for sins that you know if you sinned. In the Mosaic system, you would bring a sacrifice if you were aware of the sin. Well, the, this atonement, this annual atonement, took took into consideration if you sinned unknowingly and in it, I quote, innocently. These, this was an atonement that paid that price. Um, and I, as I keep saying, this sacrificial system had to stop because it was imperfect. So. Uh, in 70 AD, the sacrificial system was was stopped because God's justice was once and for all um, atoned for. His everything was atoned, our sin were atoned for through Christ. Okay, Katrina, could you read verse uh, five? You're muted. Just so you know, Katrina. Second, there you go. Just verse five. Okay, Christ. Okay, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Okay, and Jesus said this. This was this was coming from Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8. Uh, and that reads, then I said, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I'd like to do your will, oh my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. So Christ offered himself as a necessary sacrifice, a replacement for the sheep and the goats. They could not cleanse. Remember, God's sacrifice was to the uttermost. His cleansing was made for us to the uttermost. Uh, we have time, Bill. Just read verses 6 through 10. We'll finish there today. So I'm going to back up to part of 5. But a body have you prepared for me in burnt offerings and sin offerings. You have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. 
And read the uh, and ten. Go ahead. sure. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, and brunt and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that would and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. So again, Christ's once for all sacrifice paid the price for our sin and our entrance into God's presence. His work done once is finished. And again, we talk about, we we'll move on to talk about it sits down at the right hand of God because it's completed. It's a completed work. There is no more need for any more sacrifice because the real the real sacrifice, Jesus, has been made for us. And may God have mercy on us if we don't, on, on everyone who doesn't accept that sacrifice, who doesn't take God seriously. Um, I'm reminded when, when in what Bill read here, um, you, okay, you have neither desired nor taken delight and sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings. If you remember back in our time when we were in the reading the minor prophets, um, God chastised the Jews. They were sacrificing, but their all they were doing was going through killing animals. Their heart was far from God. They had no desire to please God. They were just doing it because that's what they were supposed to do. Uh, and I think in our, our lives, what we have to remember um, we have to willingly do God's will. Uh, it has to be, well, I got to go to church today. You know, uh, God tells us we should go to church. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Um, but, you know, it's just, uh, oh, I'm going to go today. I got to go. I really don't want to go. I, you know, um, we have to do what we do for Christ willingly. And again, it's a fruit of our. Um, repentance or fruit of our forgiveness a fruit of what jesus did for us and we are to be reminded and we need reminding because we're human we forget by studying god's word we're reminded exactly number one how holy god is and god requires blood to be sacrificed and as atonement for us doing going against god um, ever since Eden, that's been going on. The first sacrifices took place in the Garden of Eden when God slaughtered two animals to clothe Adam and Eve, made clothes for them. So, again, we have to trust in Christ's sacrifice. We have to realize that God is holy, and we have to know that that one sacrifice has paid the penalty for our sin. And in that, we can rest and have clean consciences and by having a clean, a cleansed conscience, we can go forth and do the work that God's given us to do. And that's various things we need to do. Whatever God's given us to do, we need to do. And live our lives. And and don't forget who he is and what he's done. And that's very easy to do. All right. That's it's now one minute to seven. Mike, would you pray for us today, please? As we go so, on. Uh Father, we thank, uh, thank you, and we, we thank Scott for his efforts this morning and to enlighten us onto the scripture, um, praying for those who aren't with us this morning who are um, traveling and then vacationing, that you bring them back safe to us. Uh, and we'll pray for our pastor as he prepares a message for us for Sunday that we may come together and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. 
To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.